All right, hello everyone. You get the fun talk. There's no security terms or acronyms, nothing like that with me. Um, I'm doing my talk on retro uh, modding, so I'm really big into the retro scene. I love old video games and everything. So a little bit about me is I work at Adobe. Uh, I do like uh, tinkering with things. You know, I've been involved with the security conferences and stuff for uh, quite many years, Def Con, St. Con, and now with B-Sides. Uh, like I said, I love to do retro modding and gaming. Uh, I have two puppies. And I totally compromised all the badges at St. Con in 2016. Narwhals. So I pwned all them one year with me and my buddy. We totally took that over. It was a lot of fun. It was a uh, big difference from DEF CON where everything's out of your league. St. Con was awesome. So go to St. Con if you can. It's great. Okay, so first things first, what is my talk not about? Uh, I'm not going to be talking about emulation. I'm not going to be doing anything like um, the Steam Deck, RetroPy, the Misters, anything like that. I'm going to be focusing purely on original hardware. Um, just kind of an example here. This is my setup at home. I collect consoles. Um, I like tinkering with them. I like building them. I like trying to get the authentic feel, the gameplay out of them. I mean, it's super easy to hook up a Raspberry Pi and play any game you want. But that's, it's not the same as, you know, your childhood of sitting on your square little Nintendo controller and playing Burger Time. And so uh, this kind of began my little quest of tinkering and buying and selling and doing things like that. Um, if, oh, by the way, if anyone has a question anytime, just raise your hand. I'm happy to interact and talk about what, what's going on up here if you want. So if anyone's involved with retro gaming these days, they will know that cart prices and game prices are insane. Uh, I just picked a few random games from a couple different consoles. I mean, we're like Chrono Trigger right here is $230 loose game. Game only, no box or anything. With a box, it's $1,300. It's crazy. Um, any good game will cost retail or more from back then. It's just out of control. So um, I've got my talk in three different kind of categories here. The first one is games are so much money that I was trying to find a way to play legit cartridges on my consoles without resorting to like flash cards or something like that. So I started buying games in Japan. Japanese games are super cheap, super, super cheap, uh, like silly cheap. I paid $6.75 for these eight games. Really, really cheap. I mean, the fees were more than the games itself. The uh, proxy fees and the shipping to get them to me, $14 though for eight games. I mean, you can see I've got two Chrono Triggers, Final Fantasy, Mario RPG, Super Mario All-Stars, and a couple other games I didn't care about. Dirt, dirt cheap. But there's a problem here. Who can speak Japanese? <laughs> I can't speak Japanese, but I love these games. I love, I really wanted Mario RPG, but that one was just way too out of my price range for one game. You know, especially when I can emulate, play the same game. You know, but I really wanted to play it. So, yes. Nope, I'll show you what I do though. So there are some games you can get from Japan that are absolutely playable. Street Fighter 2, I've got Street Fighter 2 for the Super Famicom. Plug it in, you go. Most of it's in English already. You can play it just fine. Funny enough, um, other than like RPGs and things, a lot of Japanese games have a lot of English in their games because English to them is cool. So they'll put English in their game, you know, like start and select and character names and stuff. And for example, by Street Fighter, only the cutscenes between battles where they diss each other are in Japanese, and I don't care anyway. You know, it's like, oh, you're super weak, I'm gonna trounce you, you know, like, I don't care. You know, just continue on, it, totally playable. Super Mario All-Stars, totally playable. All the menus are in English. The issue is with the RPGs, because there's a lot of dialogue, and so a lot of the dialogue's in Japanese. Um, I tried a different route with this, to try to figure out how I could play my super cheap $2 Super Mario RPG in English. Um, so this is a picture of the actual game cart Super Mario RPG. 
Um, and when we got basic things, the mask ROM, the RAM chip, a battery for the backup and things. Um, doing a bunch of research online, I actually came across some things where you can take a memory chip, just a cheap old memory chip like this, program a new mask ROM on the cart, and stick this on the cart. So if you go over to, um, it's not Tindy, it's uh, the other shop place, uh, Etsy. So someone was selling this on Etsy. So this here is a mask ROM adapter. So it takes that 27C32 chip, which in this case uh, I think was a 32 meg chip, megabit chip, and it will convert it to fit where the mask ROM was on the cartridge. And this thing was like two bucks. So I'm in it, what, two dollars for the cart, two dollars for this, I'm in it four dollars now. So this is that same cartridge where I've taken the mask ROM off. You just use a hot air gun, pulls right off, and we gotta stick our thing on there. So it's a different color in the shot, but that right there is where the mask ROM adapter lives. So we took the mask ROM adapter, stuck it on there, and you have to chop the little legs off, and you can then solder it to the adapter, which adapts the big chip to the little mask ROM pinouts. Um, and then you end up programming it in a programmer like this. Um, that is very theoretically wonderfully easy. Um, and then, then you get crazy stuff like I do here, where, where you stick all this on, you take the mask ROM off, you solder the adapter on, you solder the chip on after you've chopped off all the legs and it doesn't work. And so you, instead of ruining a whole cartridge and a mask ROM and an adapter, you solder something like 48 pins directly to the board, directly to some headers so you can stick it in the programmer without taking it back off the board. Um, that didn't work actually. <laughs> Uh, I don't remember the exact reasons, but it was something about uh, the different pins pulling different states while attached to the board, that even though I spent all this time building this contraption, this monstrosity here, it didn't actually, it wouldn't reprogram. Um, so I did end up taking it completely apart, taking it completely off, taking a fresh chip. And by the way, um, let's get back to my chip. Where is it? Right here. So if anyone's familiar with these, they've got a little window in them. And these chips are rewritable. So you expose this chip to ultraviolet light and you can flash the ROM, or uh, wipe the ROM. And then you can go do a check sum on it, make sure it's zeroed out, and then you can reflash it again. I think what happened was when I was originally doing this, because if you see on this shot, there is no, nothing over that mask ROM. I think it got corrupted between me soldering it back and forth in the lights and things. So, I ended up doing this all again from scratch, covering the mask around with tape this time, put it all together, and it worked. So here I have Super Mario RPG in English. So in this case, I took the English ROM, programmed it to the chip, stuck it on the legit board, and now I have a authentic Super Mario RPG cartridge in English. And theoretically, you can do this with any game. Some games have little different adapters, different ROM types, uh, but there's, there's someone called Voltar, who makes little stacker chips where you can stack different ROMs together to make 32 meg carts uh, in different styles. Okay, so not everyone wants to do that. So that's honestly a lot of work and for me to save, you know, 50 bucks. But it's what I do for fun, so it's not so bad for me. But a lot of people don't want to do that or don't have the skills to solder off mask ROMs and flash mask ROMs or anything like that. So we have to have other options for our games. Um, so we have optical disc emulators for our uh, CD, DVD based systems, Sega CD, PlayStation, things like that. Uh, we've got flash carts for our cart based systems, Sega, Super Nintendo, you know, Game Boy, Game Gear. Uh, flash drives for like our Wii, run straight off a of flash drive, no problem. Uh, PS2, I can run all my PS2 games off a network, I don't even have to have a drive. So I've got a custom memory card, it boops into custom software, and I just do an SMB share with my games in the list. List them up, pull them up, play, done. And then there's others that use SD cards, SD card based things like a GameCube, which I'll show you in a bit. So I'm just gonna talk about the, the optical ones first. So if anyone's ever had a bad optical drive, you'll get a message like this. 
especially with the PlayStation. You know, please enter PlayStation disc. I, I did. It's in there. It's clean. Drives die. And replacing your drives is about as complicated as swapping ROM on a cartridge. So instead of chucking out your system, oh, we've got different options. And I'll, I'll go through a couple of these here. The first one uh, I did was, this is a PlayStation 1. So this is called an X station. Uh, it's basically a quick solder board that you solder around different points on the chip, uh, the motherboard. You pull the ground, you, you hit the points, and then you gotta lift some pins off the CPU, which basically negates some of the, the video signals and signals going to the, the drive. And you can see in that bottom picture, there's a ribbon cable adapter. So that ribbon cable adapter then attaches to another board here, and that board here's got an SD card slot in it, and it's also got an SP32, so you could update the firmware wirelessly. A lot of these new ones have wireless firmware updaters on them. Um, and then you get a 3D printed insert in there, and it's super clean. You can still pop out the SD card without taking it apart. Pop the disc, there's no discs or anything, there's no drive. You hit play and it pulls up a menu of your games that you've loaded onto the system, and off you go. Faster than the discs, too. I got a blank slide for some reason. All right, and this one here. This one here is GameCube. Um, I got a couple different ones for the GameCube. This one is super, super cheap, but that's what's kind of bad about it, too. Uh, you could buy this chip for like five bucks. You solder it to the back side of the board after you tear the whole system apart, and it allows you to. Um, use this little red adapter here. This little red adapter plugs into the serial port on the bottom of the GameCube. And that's like $3 too. Super cheap. Stick an SD card in there you got from Walmart for another 10 bucks, and for $25 you've got a completely modded GameCube that will run games off the SD card. There is a problem, there are a couple problems with this one actually. They're cheap. These mods are super cheap, so they're not built well. There's not a lot of tolerances, and you can really mess things up when you're soldering that uh, GC loader on the bottom there. Uh, and then there's the second part of this. How do we load the GC mo loader? So normally you can go online and buy a, it's called Swiss. You can buy a disk containing Swiss OS, which boots, and that's what this little chip on the bottom does. That little chip on the bottom lets you run burned games. So you get the little burned, the chip that allows you to burn games, you get a, a disk called Swiss, which then loads the OS to load the software off the red part, and then you get your list of games in a very pretty place. Uh, those disks are very finicky. You can burn your own mini disk. They're still super finicky. Um, and then I do something like this, because I'm impatient and don't want to wait, is I took a soldering iron to a regular sized DVD put it in my broken PlayStation drive so it will spin, and I turned the, hot, you know, the soldering iron on and melted it into a perfect shape I needed for my GameCube. Totally worked. The second time. <laughs> I, I, I totally don't have a picture or video of the first time where the disc actually exploded as it was spinning. Because I added more voltage to the PlayStation drive so it spin a lot faster. You know, I'm going from like five volts up to, you know, 15. And so it's cruising and I was shaving it down and it caught an edge or something and just exploded to pieces. Since we got the soldering iron. The soldering iron worked much better because it sealed the edges too because, you know, discs have plastic, film, plastic. And when we melted it, sealed it shut. It worked pretty well. Put that in there and it worked until I swapped it out. Uh, this other method here, uses a, a Raspberry Pi Pico. I don't need the GC chip on the bottom at all, and it's something like five wires that we wire in, and the, the Pico then injects the code to boot Swiss. You still use the bottom part that contains your SD card, but this will boot it super fast and reliably every single time. And you still get your disk drive to use things. Uh, and this is currently what I have in my system here, and it works wonderfully. Uh, those are my two examples for the, um, the ODE's optical disk game leaders. You've got, I've got other systems with these in here, like I've got a Sega Saturn, same idea. It takes a card, Saturn's even easier, it just plugs in line to the disk drive, no soldering whatsoever, super easy. Uh, they also make them for like the 3DO, the Dreamcast, pretty much anything you want. Um, but what about our Super Nintendo and our Genesis, the, the other two I play a lot. And so we use things like this. 
And these are made by a guy named Crix, and he makes flashcards. And these flashcards are extremely high quality. They will play you know, your Super FX games. The Genesis one will play your 32X games, your Sega CD games, all off the flashcard. But they're not cheap. The good ones like this FX pack for the Super Nintendo, it's like 200, 250. Same with the, the EverDrive Pro. Now, if you don't care about like Genesis, or sorry, Sega CD games, and you just want straight Genesis games, you can get the lower versions for 60 to to $100. Just kind of depends on what your target is, what you want to do with it. Um, I've got a couple of these, and they work really well. You can take your system off to a family function, plug and play, off you go. Works slick. Okay, and that's with my, that's the end of my emulator portion, portion not emulator, but uh, getting the old games to work on the systems that are failing or don't function anymore. Um, who knows what this is? Yeah, if you're old enough, you used one of these playing your system. I believe this one's from an Atari. 2600 that had an RCA output that wasn't RCA. It was RF. So this is a VHF adapter that used to hook to your old antenna connection on your old, old TV. Uh, yeah, I used a few of those in my days. And then we grew up, and we made it to our Nintendo. And we could just put it right in the barrel jack. Um, then after that, we had our Super Nintendo 64 GameCube. We used a connection like this, RCA connection, or composite. And then we got a little older and we got component video. So with our component video, we're allowed, you know, much cleaner signal because we got RGB basically coming out of it. And then these days we got HDMI. So I'm gonna kind of go over these a little bit, kind of their benefits and uses and what I'm doing with it. Um, I skipped RF because no one's using RF. Let's just face it. Some of these TVs don't even have RF anymore. So we're just gonna skip that. This is a composite picture or yellow cable, you know, yellow, red, and white cables. This is composite, and you can see that there's a lot of artifacting going on along the black line and the top of Mario. You can see that the colors kind of bleed up and down with that. And then I'm gonna go to the polar opposite, and we've got our emulators running HDMI. Super crisp pixels. Unfortunately, neither, I, in my opinion, now, you can play a game any way you want. Play your game, have fun, I don't care how you play it. Um, brings up the debate here. We've got our super radioactive black box or our smart TV that spies on you. Yeah. You can play Duck Hunt and stuff on the CRTs. They do not work on the flat screens. So in general though, generality, Duck Hunt, no Duck Hunt. I mean that's just, we should just stop there. but. So there, there's, there's pros and cons to both. One I have on my wall, it's flat and it's giant. The other one is, you know, 180 pounds and makes this weird noise that the kids complain about. Like, Dad, can you hear that noise? Like, yes, I can hear the noise. We, can, we all know that whine of the TV. We could hear it in the other room and we knew someone was watching TV. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit here. <clears throat> I gotta hurry here, I'm not gonna get through things. So we're gonna take here, Simon Belmont. Uh, this is a emulated version on an HDTV. Perfect crisp pixels. And then here's the uh, CRT version of the same picture. And so we can see one is kind of a mess and the other one is more of what the developers wanted the image to look like. And we can see there's a pretty big difference. And then I've got another example here as well. <clears throat> this one should be a little more familiar to everyone. We've got our Street Fighter 2 cast here. We've got our emulated super sharp pixels and then what the artist really intended for it to look like. And I'll go back and forth a little bit. You can see it kind of brings out some features in their faces that aren't visible in the pixels, especially up in Saget on the top right. They look like drawings now instead of uh, pixel graphics. <clears throat> and so the question now is we have most of our old systems our composite video, and we kind of hit component a little bit on the Xbox 360, and then we went to HDMI. So now we either got the composite video of the Mario with the bleeding edges, or we get the crispy critters here. So, but there's in between. Um, so we use little chips like this. These are, this one's actually on a uh, Super Nintendo Mini. 
Um, but the, the N64 does a very similar thing. Um, it's just basically an RGB chip that you can solder right on the output headers. These are super simple. Uh, the chip slides right on the headers. We solder the chips, and then we get basically a power ground and a sink. We solder in. Not very complicated. Unlike an HDMI mod. This is an HDMI mod on a Super Nintendo. Um, this one's actually a simple one compared to others. But you have to solder ribbon cables directly to the, the video boards, the video chips, in order to get direct access for HDMI. And then when you do get the HDMI, we look like this again. So, so there's in between going on. Um, and this is my favorite thing I've got right now. This is an HD retrovision cable. Uh, they run for about $65, and it will take an RGB signal directly from your console and pipe it to a compo component output. Uh, the downside of this is it does run at 240p on most of these old systems, and so your, your big fancy TV will not work with them. Actually, there's a couple uh, CRTs that don't work with it either. But we, we have solutions for this too. Um, these cables, for the most part, will work on systems. Some systems, you have to put RGB um, adapters on them, like the N64. I did. The SNES Mini, you'd have to as well. But there's definitely some that will plug and play. So the PlayStation, PlayStation 2, Genesis, Saturn, those will plug and play. RGB output right out of the box. Um, I'm going to show you a couple examples, because I'm running out of time of the difference between your composite video and your component video on my CRT TV. So this is MDK. So you can see on the left is my component video, and on the right is the composite. And you can see the sharpness that I get just from upgrading my cables to an RGB signal. And then this one's another, another one you can tell a lot. It is in focus, it really is. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. Crisp versus fuzzy. Um, and then some people will say, well, why don't we just get one of these things off Amazon? Don't do, don't do that. Uh, they're garbage. Um, they're terrible, terrible upscalers. Uh, they basically take the signal and just shoot it out. That's the end of it. So what do we do if we don't want to have a 180-pound CRT sitting in our living room, and we, but we still want our games to look like the games they were intended? Um, I'm showing you the extreme example because this is by far the best thing that's come out this yet. This is a RetroTINK 4K. So what this does is this is an upscaler. So you can see on the bottom, we can take component input, RGB, VGA, and whatever, and it will upscale it 4K, and we can apply different filters to make it look like it's a CRT TV. And we're not talking just black line every other frame, because that's what a lot of the cheap scalers do, is they'll just take, take the image, they'll insert a black line every other frame to make it look like scan lines. So, for example here, this is Sony PVM. PVM just stands for Professional Video Monitor. It's just a high-end screen, that's all it is. Uh, but we can see the, the pixels coming through the cathode ray tube through the uh, aperture grill. And there's a little bit of bleed over and a little bit of um, fuzziness to it, but you've got every pixel, per se, in the screen. Now this uh, RetroTINK that just came out, it came out this week, so it's not even a week old just came out this week, and since it's a 4K capable upscaler, and if you use it on an OLED screen, you can get this upscaler to display your game like this on your flat screen TV. And so it can emulate those nuances of the CRT TV using modern hardware, and you can still use consoles, and you can still use your games and everything. It's awesome. So it's kind of an example of what uh, Ninja Turtles would look like up close. You can see the individual pixels just like it would be on a CRT TV. Uh, there is a downside to this one, and it's $750. <laughs> it's brand new. It's awesome, though. I do not have one. Um, they do make older versions of RetroTINK that do awesome things like this, but not in 4K and not to this level. Um, like I said at the beginning, I don't care what you play on as long as you have fun. This is what I have fun doing. You can play on a, a, an LCD with no, no scaling whatsoever. You can get a retro tink or you can get a CRT TV. Just go have fun with your games and that's what I try to do with mine.
Uh, that's all I got. Is there any questions? Yes. I can show you how that works. You use uh, uh, OPL loader, and you can set up an SMB share to which you have to do legacy SMB because it's old enough you can't have the newer encryption. So you have to have a legacy uh, SMB share, and you can point it to an SMB location, and it will parse the games out and present them. You can just start them right up. Um, I, I was telling Bryce last night, I got seven terabytes of games in there. Um, <laughs> If you, if you whittle it down to a reasonable amount of games, uh, it'll load the list pretty quick, and I believe the games load faster than off the disk. So. Uh, so you should go check out that retro tink 4K. It's brand new, and it's pretty dang close. There, there's a video from 8-Bit Lawyer Go go check that one out. Yeah. No, the emulation definitely has its place. I my talk was just specifically about old physical hardware, but we could talk about emulation for another hour. Yes. I have I have a few flashcards. Yes. Um, I I don't have time to translate every single game. <laughs> so I I do it for fun, translating games and swapping out ROMs. But I do have flashcards on most of my cart-based systems. It's just my employer. <laughs> yes. So uh, the Super Nintendo is, the, is a physical region lock. So on the Super Nintendo, there's two little pins. If you look on the bottom of a Super Nintendo cartridge, there's two little slots. And inside the United States Super Nintendo, there's two little tabs in there that lock out other games. If you take a chisel, pop those two tabs off, Super Famicom games go in just fine. There's no region lock on those. There's not a region lock on a lot of games, cartridges-based games. It's when we start getting the CD media that it gets a little fuzzy. And then if you do an ODE, you put all the stuff on there, and it doesn't matter anyway. I think I'm out of time, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about any of this if you want. And I'll be over here. <laughs>